Well, there's a popular word that finds its way in application throughout just about every industry, every aspect of our busy world. If you look it up, you'll find the word synergy defined as the combined power of a group of agents working together that is greater than the total power achieved by individual agents working alone. In other words, you alone can accomplish only so much. But you and someone else combining your efforts can accomplish so much more. It's like we enjoyed the choir and the orchestra. There's a lot of moving parts. Anyone individually could not have produced what we were able to experience in worship. There was synergy at work. In a, in a word, synergy is teamwork. It is cooperation. Here's a word everyone knows a lot about today. It's the word collusion. Oh, now you're awake. Thank you. Welcome here to the second hour. Collusion, by the way, is illegal synergy. It's when people are working together in secret to do something they shouldn't do, whether it's changing the price, manipulating the price of a stock on Wall Street, or maybe getting a bid slid under the table for a contractor, or maybe as we hear it just about every day as it relates to political influence. In the spiritual world, synergy is really a wonderful word for the church. A lot of moving parts but all working together to bring glory and honor to Christ. Synergy, you can think of it as disciple making. It's taking the time to teach someone the truth of the Word of God, lead, lead them to, to understand what it means to have faith in Christ alone, to take the time to develop them. It is synergistic in its nature. I, I did a little work on that word and found it, it was interesting if, if you understand speech, you're listening to me speak right now, at least that's the theory, and in order for you to hear me say anything, it's going to take 72 muscles working together to produce speech, 72 muscles cooperating. I was thrilled to know that I've still got 72 muscles cooperating <laughs> to do this. Let me give you another illustration on the impact of synergy as it relates to disciple making. When a female ant of a certain species, which I cannot pronounce, goes out to bring back food, she will go to the, the colony and find a younger ant to accompany her back to the food source. As the older ant runs along the path to food, she's already found, the student, you could think of it, the, 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 the disciple, the learner, is following behind, but will often fall behind because it's going to stop and explore, you know, some things along the way, it gets distracted, uh, and uh, that creates this gap between the two. But each time when the younger ant is ready, it will run forward and tap the teacher ant on her hind legs, and off they will run again, and then they'll stop again and start over, stopping and starting again and again. As you can imagine, this process is especially tiring to the older ant, uh, who wants to get the job done. It's kind of like you in the kitchen, you know, with your three-year-old running around, you're trying to fix dinner, or your husband who is trying to help. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, researchers have observed that if the teacher were able to travel by herself, she could travel four times faster. Four times faster. But if she did... And because she won't, the student ant learns how to do it and where it is, and it actually then teaches other young ants, which increases the potential of the entire colony. Now, I found this interesting. Get this. Some teacher ants in this species, for some unknown 
reason, decide to keep doing it by themselves. They know they're supposed to get a younger ant, and what they do is they go back to the colony and they grab a young ant and sling it onto their back and carry them to the food source and then drop them off to help them haul the food back. It all works faster. They both load up with food, head back home. However, the young ant isn't able to go back alone or teach others to go with it, and so it never multiplies the process even though initially it seems so much faster. Yes, it takes longer, but in the end you double and triple and quadruple your efforts. This is synergy at work. This is where you take the place where God has put you and the gifts God has given you and the resources you have and you combine them with the rest of us. We pool our resources. We use our gifts. We cooperate with others. And by combining our efforts, we're able to accomplish more together than we could ever accomplish alone. This is exactly the idea in the mind of an old disciple maker named John. Let me show you Let's turn back to our New Testament postcard titled 3 John, 3 John. Let's get a running start here by going back to verse 5 where Gaius is being commended by John for his hospitality, for helping these vocational church leaders who had come through town. And what I want to do is I want to read my own amplified paraphrase where I've sort of stuffed in some of the interpretation that we pulled out as we studied the first part of this paragraph last Lord's Day, and I think it'll catch us all up. So you follow along in your text as I read my own paraphrase. Here it goes. My dearly loved friend, you are acting faithfully in all the ways you serve these church workers, and especially those whom you've never met before. They've testified in a church service of your loving hospitality. Keep doing such a beautiful job as you care for them just like you would care for God if he showed up at your home. They took the gospel out on the road to tell the world about Jesus, the name above every name, and they were determined never to rely on the financial support of unbelievers. And that's where we left off. Now, let's unpack what John writes next as he concludes the thought with verse 8. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. What I want to do is give you two words that summarize this text of Scripture as John summarizes his thoughts. The first word is ownership. Take ownership. It's yours, but now you need to own it. That's the idea. I mean, we own it, but do we own it? He writes, therefore, we ought to support such men. The word he uses for ought is a strong word which refers to a moral and spiritual obligation. And in this context, John is making the case for the church to essentially support vocational church workers. These would be the traveling evangelists the global workers, the teachers, the church planters, and those now in our generation we refer to here, colonials, vocational pastors and missionaries, church staff members, global partners, global staff members who work in other countries around the world. Now, you need to understand it's easy for us to gloss over this. Yeah, 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 we get it. But when John is writing this, this is, this is new. This is radical. Because back in the early days of the church, there wasn't anything like a vocational, fully funded church worker. That didn't exist. Whether you were a pastor or a global worker or an evangelist or a church planner or using your skills as an engineer and printer and teacher somewhere on the field somewhere else, there was no, no, there was no concept of you getting full support from a church. 
And so this is the suggestion of something that's really new. In fact, he uses the present tense for you ought. This is an ongoing obligation. This is an ongoing ownership. This, is, this isn't going to stop. You don't put it on pause. I know of churches that will do a building program and they just sort of suspend their global support and they say, we're going to use it now. We'll go back to that later. You don't suspend this. And this would be a radical idea for the attendance of the assembly where they are reading this letter from John. This is a radical idea. In our last session, I, I mentioned William Carey, and I want to go back a little bit to his biography for illustration, a man who would pioneer in modern days the work of Christ in India. He's known today as the father of modern missions. He asked four businessmen if they would hold the ropes while he descended into the gold mine of India, and they came up with this rope-holding pledge we talked about. But even before Carey decided to go to India, he, he just became burdened to deliver the gospel, and he, he began to preach as an itinerant preacher, much of it out in the open, and evangelize in the region. In fact, several pastors made notation in their own journals that their, that their, their pews were filling up by means of William Carey's efforts, even though he didn't attend their church. the efforts of this shoe cobbler. Now, his shoemaking business was then, as he spent more time preaching, beginning to literally and figuratively pile up. And he, he, he got behind. He was finding it difficult with what we would call today a bivocational life. In fact, I, I read in his biography how a friend sort of got onto him one day for it. And, 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 and sort of uh, exhorted uh, William Carey on, and I quote, neglecting your shoemaking business. You're neglecting it. To which Carey replied, and I quote, neglecting my business. My business is to extend the gospel of Christ. I only make shoes to pay expenses. It wasn't long before Carey will write a pamphlet urging the church at large to support individuals who want to give their lives to the ministry. And the name of that booklet is rather long, so I put it here on the screen. An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. How's that for a book title? Well, it became a bestseller. And it created a firestorm of controversy. What do you mean it's our obligation? What are you talking about? Where'd you get that from? Third John, verse 8. It was nothing more than this phrase, expanded and applied. John writes, notice again, therefore, we ought to support such men. The word for support is a wonderful combination word. Hupo lambano. Hupo means under. And lambano is to receive or to catch, to catch under, to hold underneath. We use that word in our common vernacular today to talk about underwriting someone's expenses, someone's needs. It's exactly what John is telling us that we need to do, to underwrite them. Jesus, by the way, introduces this idea long before the apostles. He sort of nudges everybody to consider this thought that will be developed in the church age after he ascends and the Spirit descends. He introduces the concept. He's telling his disciples on one occasion as he sends them out two by two that they're to go into towns and villages and when they arrive to find lodging with somebody who is sympathetic to the gospel message they're delivering. And then Jesus says, stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. He's laboring in the gospel, but that's labor. And that's worthy of being paid. And you can pay him 
by at least giving him something to eat and to drink. And he tells his disciples, whatever they give you to eat and drink, eat that and drink that. Couldn't help but remember I mentioned last Lord's Day when my three brothers and I traveled with our missionary parents on deputation in the summer times to visit supporting churches and families. We would pull into the driveway of some supporting family at about dinner time and uh, assuming potentially they were going to feed us dinner and we were reminded as we pulled into the driveway by our mother of how we were to behave and she would always repeat this a little poem that I knew my brothers needed reminding. I, I, I had it down. Where he leads me, boys, she would say, I will follow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. <laughs> now, I might complain of vegetables back home. I might even hide, as I did those little green peas under my plate at home. In fact, my mother and I were talking on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and she, we were reminiscing about uh, what, a, what a perfect child I was. <laughs> uh, I've got a better memory, evidently, than she does. <laughs> Actually, she's forgotten a lot of things. But at any rate, we didn't have a dog to feed that stuff to under the table. So I just sort of mashed it under my plate, and then I'd go run before she'd find out. And she figured it out, and one day she went out and actually came home, and she had bought clear glass plates. <laughs> that was a horrifying day. <laughs> what he feeds me, I will swallow. Well, Jesus is basically supporting early on this concept of support. Later on, Paul is going to write the Romans He's going to graciously hint at what he hopes is going to happen. Whenever I go to Spain, I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. I'm going to, I'm going to come there. I'm on my way to Spain. I'm going to need your help. And he kind of graciously hints, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Read in between the lines. I really want you to pass the plate. Somebody's going to buy me a ticket so I can get on that boat. He added to this concept of vocational ministry when he wrote a little more bluntly to the Corinthians. They were a little hard-headed. He got to speak a little more bluntly. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? I mean, is that really too much to ask? 1 Corinthians 9, 9. And then again, he, he, he hints at his dependency on them when he writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 16, I'm going to pass your way into Macedonia and by you be helped on my journey to Judea. In other words, let me give you something to think about. You, you plan ahead of time for this. Give it some prayerful thought. Hint, hint. And by the way, that's the tension. That's the tension of people in ministry, our global workers, those who are vocational. They, they, they live with that. You can't come out and ask for money, but you need it, right? So be aware of that when they come into town. They're not going to say, would you give me some money? That, that, that would be wrong. But just know they need it. When they, when they come over to your home and they're going to spend the night, ask them if they're hungry. You didn't need anything to eat. You'd be surprised. You're providing for them, but he hints at this. He just graciously hints at this. Not John. This is where, you know, a little bit of that son of thunder nickname comes out again. He just gets right to it and dogmatically writes, we ought to support such men. All in favor? This was new territory for them. And I have to tell you, unfortunately, that if you study church history, you'll find the church has always been slow to respond to this sense of ownership. In fact, when William Carey decided to leave England for India in the late 1700s, churches didn't have mobilization budgets. They rented pews 
So they got their money. They rented pews. And the front rows were always the most expensive, which is why people rarely sit in them. Thank you, guys. That's how they got their money. And so when, when Carrie, you know, is asking for support, it didn't exist. In fact, there was an admission agency to send him. They had to create one. This is 1,700 years in that country after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. In fact, when these four businessmen I mentioned made this pledge to underwrite him, church leaders thought these men had lost their minds. They thought these men didn't have enough sense to know how to run away from a bad deal. They spoke openly against it. One well-known pastor in England who was a, a great orator and, and a writer, nobody you would be aware of, more than likely, but he came out publicly and he wrote that if you're going to support this this man, you need to understand that he and these men are nothing more than, quote, a nest of consecrated cobblers. They're just shoe cobblers. Uneducated shoe cobbler. That's what William Carey was. He'd never been out of his neighborhood. You're going to go to India? Are you crazy? That well-known pastor, by the way, I'm not going to give you his name. You've, in fact, never heard of him. And I'd never heard of him either until I heard his name mentioned in the biography of William Carey. On one occasion, as he's trying to raise support, William Carey steps into a pulpit of a church, and someone had hung a pair of old shoes in the pulpit to mock him. You're just a shoemaker. I love what he did. He lifted the shoes up and he said, this is a wonderful demonstration that if God can use a shoemaker, he can use all of you. John essentially says we're playing a part in this eternally significant synergistic effort, our mission. We've got to take ownership of it. We own this. Now let's own it. Number two, the second word that comes to my mind is the word opportunity. Notice the last part of verse eight. So that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I love it. In fact, this is the word that sort of sent me on this theme. The word for fellow worker is synergos, which gives us our transliterated word synergy. You are working in tandem with, in cooperation with, synergistically with these men who go out on the road. So when you pray for that church worker, when you write that letter of encouragement, when you share that meal with a servant of the Lord, when you give them a car to, to drive, when you give them a place to sleep, when we come together and what's our individual offering going to do? Probably not much. But combined, wow. This is synergism. What an opportunity we have. We're not giving, as one man told me, because you have to, but because you get to. In fact, John writes, notice you're in a, a synergistic relationship with the truth. You're, you're, you're accompanying the truth. That's why Jesus said, when you take care of a prophet, you get the prophet's reward. Wait a second, I wasn't out there, I know. But you supported him, and you're going you're gonna to share in his reward. Paul told the Philippian church, you are sharing in the fruit that I'm, that I'm receiving. Where, where did they go? Nowhere. They supported him. They prayed for him. They encouraged him. It's an amazing thought. Do we get it? Do we get this? The truth that is delivered through these ministries, through these classrooms, through these pastors, global workers, through that Awana worker. Behind the scenes, servants of Christ, he didn't just supporting, 
It isn't just giving. So this, te this text asks us two primary questions. First, are we developing a sense of synergy? I mean, do we get it? Do we get the fact that God has chosen to administrate His plan through us? He didn't need us. He didn't need our money. He didn't need our gifts. The amazing thing about His grace is that He's chosen to join us with each other and us with Him. In fact, listen to how Paul writes it to the Corinthian church. He writes, we are fellow workers Synergeo, same word. We are synergistically working with God. With God. Same word. Are we developing a sense of synergy? Secondly, are we developing a spirit of generosity? We discovered together where John says, Gaius, you're doing beautifully, you're doing wonderfully. It's a beautiful thing you're doing. Keep it up. Don't stop. He's worth it. The gospel is worth it. His servants are worth it. The church is worth it. The name of Christ is worth it. The saving of souls and the discipling of believers is worth it. The advancement of the church around the globe is worth everything. It's worth everything. So we all become involved in eternally significant synergy. I think the timing of the Lord has been wonderful on our behalf. These are our global impact days. And this is the voting of a budget. I mean, we own it. Are we going to own it? This is grace promise season. If you're new around here, we, we make an anonymous promise. You don't Sign your name, but we do need you to hand it in. And then there is a Grace Promise team led by our, admin, our, our mobilization office that says, okay, this much by the grace of God will come in. And if it comes in, here are more projects, uh, more workers, more strategic, intentional activity that we can get involved in over and above our budget. That doesn't mean that our budget isn't any less gospel-oriented. Without that, we're not meeting here. There isn't staff. There isn't global staff. We can't pay the electrical bill. We don't make the house payment. It is all working together. But, in fact, it supports, I think somebody told me, 9,000 events that took place over the last 12 months involving 2,088 volunteers. 2,088 volunteers got involved in doing something behind the scenes, out front, whatever, working synergistically together. Let me say thank you to 2,088 of you. Thank you for serving, for playing your role. Did it matter? Well, we just scroll these and kind of give you a picture as I'm talking, but it did matter this past year as well through so many of our events on this campus, through our evangelism and outreach and discipleship making efforts, through sports ministries, English as a second language, short-term trips, ongoing evangelism explosion efforts, sharing your faith efforts, the way the cross efforts. We were able to estimate this past year that four people on average were saved every day. Four people trusted Christ alone for their salvation on average every single day. You want to say amen to that? Amen. amen indeed. Praise God for that. And through Grace Promise funds, by the way, we just, we just run a little faster. We, we, we try to keep outrunning that natural inclination that, oh, we've done enough, we've done enough, we've done enough. Let's do more. Let's do more. By the grace of God. So far, we've started a number of churches. We announced the goal of starting 20 of them by 2020, our church revitalizations, those churches that were dying where we brought a graduate of our seminary and begins pastoring it. And we wanted to start or do this in 20 churches by the end of 2020. 
We're ahead of our goal. We'll probably reach 20 by the end of halfway through this year, certainly by the end of 2019. With Grace Promise Funds, we're involved in training pastors in seven different countries, pastors in Israel, pastors who risk their lives in Muslim countries, pastors even who come here in October for our National Church Leaders Conference, which is growing in impact and outreach. 740, I think it was, came this last year, each year more. We, we launched our own mission sending agency. Why? Because we want to we underwrite William Carey. That's why. There are William Careys of our generation. And the traditional route is slow, and we recognize that. And so we decided to operate this. It's, it's called Shepherds International, but we own it. Our mobilization office administrates it. And uh, one of the blessings of it is we're not going to charge 10% of their support or 20% as some mission agencies do. We're going to underwrite it all. And that's actually coming out of our budget. We have five families now with more waiting to come aboard. This is how we develop a sense of synergy. This is how we develop a spirit of generosity. Those are the two questions that we want to ask ourselves. Are we developing a sense of synergy? Are we developing a spirit of generosity? Why bother? Why stretch? Because we understand our sense of ownership and opportunity. I can't wait till this year. Last year was wonderful, but that's last year. That God would allow us by His grace to see even more fruit abound to His glory and to His honor. That is our prayer. You'll be handed one of these cards. Take it home and uh, prayerfully consider it. Come back next Lord's Day and we'll collect them together. Stand with me. If you're visiting, we've covered a lot of things that are related specifically to this church family. Next Sunday, we'll have a guest focusing our hearts and thoughts on global impact, and then, and then I'll get back to preaching and get back to normal, and the sermon will be much longer.